Thanks, Anne Marie. Thank you. I appreciate that. Actually, it's interim director. I'm interim director at our Institute for Public Policy and Social Research for the next academic year, while Matt Grossman uh, is on sabbatical, enjoying himself in uh, in Cambridge. That's Cambridge, Massachusetts, though, not Cambridge, England. So I do know where to find him if needed. Um, Again, appreciate all of you being here. This is our 26th year of holding these forums. And uh, as far back as I can remember, Anne Marie has been our, our host, our coordinator, our director of these. Um, but over 3,000 people have gathered in this room over the years to help IPSER in its mission of connecting campus and community policy and policymakers. Our strength, of course, is providing uh, access to you and to faculty both at Michigan State University and really across the state through programs such as this legislative forum as we seek knowledge and crucial answers to compelling issues and questions before us. And certainly the issue today, I no doubt, has a lot of questions with it. Um, but we also do that at IPSER through other mechanisms and through other programs, such as our Michigan Political Leadership Program, uh, a 10-month, one weekend a month program for uh, 24 fellows. We'd urge anyone interested in seeking uh, election at some point to local or state office to apply to the program. Applications are now available. We've got some cards in the back, and they're due September 28th. Um, that program has over 600 alumni uh, scattered throughout the state, many of whom have run for public office. And uh, recent research that we've done shows that those that attend MPLP are more likely not only to run for office, but win. So again, if you're interested in running for public office someday, certainly a worthwhile program uh, to apply to. Uh, affiliated with that is, of course, our breakfast and dinner. Uh, that will be held this March. There are Save the Date cards here today. Our speakers this year are Alex, Alex Castellanos and Patty Solis Doyle, both of whom have a long history of uh, consulting and reporting uh, from both uh, Republican presidential and Democratic presidential perspectives. And uh, given uh, the current state of affairs, uh, both nationally and with elections across the country at the state level, it should make for an interesting discussion. Uh, also, we have our Rosenthal Internship Program. We'll be having a program here this Friday. And of course, uh, many of you are familiar with our State of the State Survey that we run a few times a year. As a matter of fact, we're going in the field right now, and w it will be featured on an upcoming podcast that we've started. Uh, Dr. Grossman started with Charlie Ballard uh, earlier this year. I'm continuing that with Dr. Ballard, and we'll be having a podcast on October 26th, I believe, to release those State of the State uh, survey results. Uh, of course, to find out more, you can go to our website at ipser.msu.edu. We've got a Facebook page. You can tweet us at ipser. And uh, believe it or not, we're also on SoundCloud and YouTube, so we're making use of all of the uh, media mechanisms available these days. Uh, before I turn it over to Anne Maria, I, I want to take a moment to thank our staff, uh, Cindy Kyle, our communications and marketing uh, person, uh, Millie uh, Sherov in the, in the back who helped to take care of registration and take care of all your registrations as you applied. We've also got some grad research assistants with us here today, uh, Leah and Emily and Hannah. Um, who uh, have been assisting. And of course, uh, certainly last and certainly not least, uh, Anne Marie Schneider, who has been uh, our program coordinator for these forums for a number of years um, and continues to do so and continues to do a fantastic job doing so. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Anne Marie. Yep. Thank you, Arnold. Um, well, I just also want to say thank you for being here. Uh, we welcome our media, and I'd like to give them a shout out. I think the media, all forms of media, print especially, have been amazing at covering this issue of recreational pot. Um, we're looking at a, a proposal in November that will ask voters if they 
wish to legalize recreational marijuana. And the information is out there. Every day it seems like there's uh, headline upon headline on this issue and different angles of it. And that's the complicated part, isn't it? Because this is something that covers just about every sector. Uh, we're looking at economic development and jobs. Um, health, the health fields are, are looking at this, health and well-being. Uh, we're also looking at criminal justice and sentencing. So it really hits uh, so many different nodes of our society. Uh, we can't cover all of that today. We're certainly not set up as a debate format, but we do have some expertise to, to offer you. Perhaps you haven't yet considered uh, some of the information they have for you today. And as Arnold mentioned, our role is to give you sound information to consider as you go to the polls or as just, just as you have conversations with your legislators. So let's, let's get to, to their um, presentations. First, we have Shelley Edgerton, who is the Director and Chief Data Systems Officer for the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. And Shelley's going to talk with us a little bit about the backdrop of this proposal and that she's been uniquely involved in the uh, legalization of medical marijuana since 2008. Uh, following Shelley, we'll have Dr. Jed Magan, who's the Associate Professor and Chair of Michigan State State's University of uh, Psychiatry, the Department of Psychiatry. And he's going to talk a little bit about the impact of marijuana use on the physical and mental state. What do we know about the impact of long-term marijuana use? And uh, you know, what do we know about the regular, regular use of, of medical or re re recreational marijuana? Um, and, and is that even of consideration here? And then we'll also have Deborah Furholden, who's the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health in the newly formed MSU College of Human Medicine Division of Public Health. Deborah is actually an epidemiologist, and she's looking at uh, environmental strategies for violence and substance abuse prevention in high risk and urban settings. So we'll look forward to hearing from you as well, Deborah. And we're ready to roll. So, Shelley? We're going to hear from all of our speakers. They'll just follow one another, and then we'll hold questions until the end. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Shelley Edgerton. I'm the director for the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, otherwise known as Laura. And thank you to Arnold and, and Anne Marie for the invitation to be here. Um, I, I'm looking out in the audience and I see a lot of partners, so I apologize if this is kind of uh, duplicative of what I say um, in other events. But uh, Laura's been charged with, you know, the regulatory side, and I know we're here to talk about recreational, and I'll get to that. But I think as a backdrop, you need to understand where we are in the medical market right now. Um, we were charged in 2016 by the legislature to create a regulatory program um, in basically a year, and we undertook that with great great pride and great stride, I'll say. Um, we were ready to go um, to accept applications December 15th of 2017. Um, on that day, despite all the, I'll say hoopla from the industry, um, we actually only had 11 applications turned in that day. So um, we have fast forward that to, um, you know, an aggressive applications approach. And I think for a lot of um, individuals, potential licensees, or people just to understand from a regulatory process, you know, a complete application is, is a key point because there are a lot of documents required in this process from a medical marijuana application. And, um, you know, there are a lot of documents that get left off um, either by choice or just they didn't, they didn't include it. So we've had this long drag on doing um, application review. And um, we have tried to speed that along. We've tried to increase our, our workflows within the department. We've tried to add staff. We've tried to, to do a, 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 away with a lot of, you know, maybe barriers that we saw that were impacting the potential for applications to get this whole field, this industry up and going. Um, as many of you know, um, we've had board meetings. We've, you know, um, we've adopted uh, licenses. Um, I think we have 37 currently in a variety of areas. Um, we've rejected a number of them. Those are going through an appeals process. So 
we're, we're, we're trying to formulate a, a, an industry. Um, it's a regulated industry. First time for us in Michigan on that. Not that we don't do licensing. We license over 2 million people. So um, it's not unfamiliar for us to license, but this is an entirely new operation for us. Um, and the players and the licensees and the, the nuances of, of a gray market, a black market, a temporary operator, you know, where everything has been with that. So we're trying to do the best that we can, and um, we are, you know, producing quickly, um, hopefully, more, more licensees out there to, to talk about patient access because we have always heard the patient access is an issue. Um, people can't receive their medicine. Um, we have a number of conditions that people are eligible for to qualify, but we have um, actually pushed forward. And just in terms of numbers, so you guys have a framework of where the patient population stands right now on the medical side, um, we are at 297,210 patients. Um, there are 43,284 caregivers. Um, and so we have a large population pool um, in the state of Michigan under the medical side. Um, obviously, the recreational market, you know, they don't need a card. They don't need that validation. They'll have to have a driver's license and be 21 when they walk into a store. But um, that's, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. Um, in terms of uh, the medical, the recreational market, obviously there's a ballot proposal, has to be adopted by the voters this November. And, you know, we're looking at it, um, you know, we're not sitting on our hands, not doing anything, but we are looking at what will be the requirements for the department to undertake if it is passed by the voters. Um, we're hoping to learn from, um, I'll say, the more seasoned states, the other states that have passed recreational market, a recreational market, adult use market in the past, you know, the Colorados, Alaska, you know, Washington, Oregon, all of those folks, um, to see what their best practices are in handling the recreational adult use market. Um, we've learned a lot on the medical side, so we would hope to rec replicate some of that knowledge um, and be able to um, put into play relatively quickly some of the practices and the processes that we'll need to implement if it's, a, if it's adopted by the voters. The department is not taking a position on any of this today. Um, we're just here from, I'll say, an implementation standpoint as to what could happen in the future if it's adopted um, by the voters. But overall, I mean, we have a medical market. It's progressing, and I think we'll just have to wait and see what the voters say in November. All right. My job is to talk about the science, the neurobiology of this disorder. So I've got some slides, which we're going to pop up in a minute here. If we don't, I'll just make it up, so, so it's okay. Which is about what you see in some of the press. Anyway. Um, there we go. So uh, I guess I can advance this, huh? All right, so I have no conflicts of interest. I have not... Um, um, I'm not with a dispensary, uh, you know, or I don't have any farms, anything like that. Um, this is kind of just, if you just go on the internet, this is the kind of stuff you see. And in the lower right there, you've got a, a map of the United States, which I think is current in terms of the number of states that have legalized or have legal medical marijuana, which is kind of interesting. Um, more states than I realize. And if you look at the Northeast, almost the entire Northeast and the entire West Coast, it's kind of interesting. I think the whole debate can be summed up in this, essentially. I hate to advocate drugs, alcohol, violence, or insanity to anyone. They've always worked for me. The late Hunter Thompson, journalist, who was also a physician, although he didn't advertise it. And unfortunately, and this is especially true of the medical issues around marijuana, the public discussion has really been less informed by real science than what people would really like to believe whatever their fantasies are, and so on. And um, Calvin and Hobbes, sometimes reality does intrude. So why do people take drugs anyway? Marijuana is a drug like any other drug. In fact, it's multiple drugs. So here's what happens if you go to addiction, and you can get addicted to marijuana. So the first thing that happens is you have voluntary use in search of what's called a hedonic experience, pleasure. So you smoke, and you feel good. That's a search for a hedonic experience. Or you want to talk about other drugs, you take some opiates and you feel good. That's a hedonic experience. 
Some people then begin to lose control over this behavior. They want more and they can't stop. And so they use more and they use more and they use more and they end up with, eat, with using this stuff all the time. Now that doesn't apply to everybody, but it does apply to some segment of the population. And why is this? Well, any drug, any substance that causes pleasure, I don't care whether it's an opiate or whether it's marijuana or whether it's good food you eat or sex or anything else will elevate dopamine levels in a place called the nucleus accumbens, which is that, well, it's not showing up very well, that little red sort of thing, those two little red things down in your brain there. And if you notice, they're kind of close to the frontal lobes, which are the thinking areas of the brain. And so when you get that kind of pleasurable sensation, you begin to link it to specific kinds of ideas or specific places or other kinds of things. So those become links. So if you go into a bar, you like to drink, and you go into a bar and you say, oh man, I felt good in this bar, I'm going to have a drink. That's kind of what happens. So anything that causes pleasure elevates dopamine levels. Now, here's part of the problem. You may have noticed that adolescents have somewhat different behaviors than adults. Adolescents are in many ways stupid, at least, <laughs> at least in certain segments of their life, and they, you know, they later learn not to be so dumb. So here is the age of first use for a whole variety of substances. If you notice, where are the big peaks? The big peaks are late adolescence and early adulthood. How come? How come people age five don't start using drugs? Why don't you start using drugs at age 65 or 70? Well, there are good reasons for this, and there are good neurobiological reasons, which has to do in part with this. So if you look at this, on the top, top part, you've got behavior. So look at sensation seeking. The first little bar is kids. The second bar is adolescents, and the third bar is adults. So if you look at behavior, sensation seeking, you will see adolescents are really into seeking sensations. They like stuff, and they like to do intense kind of stuff. Kids do too, but not as much. And adults, eh, relatively sedentary compared to the adolescents. Now look at impulsivity. We know that young kids are impulsive. That's just the way they are. Adolescents are less impulsive, but they're more impulsive than adults. If you put together sensation seeking, which is really big, and impulsivity, you get, well, why the hell did you do that? I don't know. That's what happens. Now, if you look at the brain, so what's the neurobiology behind this? Well, the neurobiology behind this is, remember the nucleus accumbens is where all that dopamine is. That's where you get pleasurable kind of sensations from. The nucleus accumbens in adolescence is uniquely active. So you got those dopamine levels just going up and up and up, multiple, multiple times and very quickly. Then you look, remember I said the, the frontal lobes of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that's the thinking part of the brain. And in large measure, what that does is it inhibits things. So it inhibits bodily sensations. It tells you, eh, don't do that. Better not do that because of the long-term consequences. Well, the problem with adolescence is nucleus accumbens is very active, high sensation seeking. Frontal lobes, eh, you know, active but not, not quite so inhibitory as they could be. So adolescents are uniquely set up to do stupid things. And that's a neurobiology behind that. Um, there's a good reason why all revolutions are started by young people. It's because of this. Because they got all this activity and they're impulsive and they want to do things. 60-year-olds don't start revolutions. Now, here's the other piece of this, which is, is this a, it is, how nice. Okay, so over on this side, we got, you could consider this adulthood, which is do not do stuff. So you've got control and self-regulation, which is pretty strong. Um, you've got drive to do things, which is less strong than, you know, control. You've got memory, memory of doing things, and you've got saliency. Saliency is what's immediate in your environment. What are you concentrating on? A nice piece of tiramisu, that's pretty salient to me in the environment, that kind of thing. Or if you're a substance user, wow, you know, whatever the substance is, which accounts for why one of the reasons that substance users will be very involved in whatever the substance is and their kids are sitting on the couch crying because they haven't been fed. 
the salience of that object in their environment is so great that they screen everything else out, essentially. So adulthood, you got pretty good self-control, the drive isn't so big, and the memory, because memories are important, especially for substances. If you walk into a bar, all the cues around there are to drink, and you say, ah, you know, last time I was here, that gin and tonic just tasted great. That's a memory. In adolescence, on the other hand, saliency of the object is even more, because they're impulsive and so on. The drive is really big, the control is not so good, and even the memory might be much bigger. And this is essentially what happens with substance abusers, too. If you think substance abuse is a moral failing, think again. It's really a neurobiological phenomenon. Okay? So that's kind of the neurobiology behind this sort of thing. Now, I'm not going to claim that all marijuana users are going to develop addiction, because they're not. But some will, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is, essentially. But let's start with what's in marijuana, anyway. Well, one thing is, you know, infamous THC, which is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. There's also a thing called cannabidiol, and they're very different, and they probably have different f effects. And I would point out there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we don't really understand very well in marijuana. Drugs, there's a saying in pharmacology, which is drugs are dirty, which means they have lots of effects. And so marijuana does, too, and we don't really understand very well what most of those other compounds do. So one of the problems we have is marijuana causes psychosis. I've seen marijuana psychoses in young people. Pretty clear that it probably does. Certainly not everybody, small number of people. And why is that? Well, that might be the THC. THC, bad. On the other hand, cannabidiols may be good. So when you read things about you know, young child had a seizure disorder and the seizures were stopped because they're giving him marijuana. That's probably the cannabidiol. Seems like. We think it is. On the other hand, if you read about somebody who became psychotic, it's probably the THC or it might be a bunch of other things we don't really understand very well. So potential medical uses, control of some kinds of seizures, yes. Pain relief, yeah, probably if you either smoke it or if you use um, the marijuana creams and so on, rub those on, and it seems to help for pain, so those seem legitimate. Other medical uses of marijuana, who knows? If you believe there are other medical, other, uh, medical uses of marijuana at this point, that's probably fantasy. We don't really understand that very well. So lots of claims by people, but not really very good literature in terms of what really works or not. So, marijuana use, probably not risky for periodic adult users. Your brain is pretty well formed, relatively static. It's not going to change a whole lot, probably. Um, is it a problem for any heavy users? Yeah, sure, because they have all kinds of issues. A motivation, spending lots of money, all kinds of things are problematic. To say nothing of what you're doing to your lungs. Is marijuana carcinogenic? Might be. We're not so sure. A potential problem for anyone under about 20 to maybe 25-ish because of the neurobiology. So young people's brains are much more plastic. They change much more readily than older folks like us. So what is that marijuana doing to a young person's brain? Well, we know one thing is you can get psychotic and probably other things can happen, but we don't understand that very well. Um, and certainly a problem for anybody vulnerable to psychosis, or let's say you're a kid and you have a parent who has schizophrenia. I would not recommend that you smoke, essentially ever. <coughs> How about impairment? We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, um, a motivational syndrome. So what about driving? Kind of a problem. And is marijuana a gateway drug? Well, we don't know the answer to that one. People would say no, but there are studies on both sides of this thing. There's good reason to believe that there's at least a correlation between cigarette smoking and marijuana. Now that's, you know, maybe it's just because people like oral kinds of stuff or something. We don't know, but there does seem to be this correlation. So there's some information about this. We know the neurobiology of this thing pretty well only because we've invest investigated the neurobiology of other substances, but it translates pretty well. Um, we know a little bit about medical uses, but not a whole lot, really. And, you know, we don't really know. I mean, 
I think we're pretty comfortable with adults, but for anybody else, we really don't understand the long-term consequences very well. So you're dealing with an area where we know some things, but we don't know a lot, where there's a lot we don't know. And I think I will stop right there. Stay away. I know I'm an academic, so not having PowerPoints is, I feel a bit like I'm naked, but I'm gonna um, uh, just share. I have some talking points. Um, and, and one thing that, that I thought was really great about what um, Jet was saying in some areas, and I'm super proud to call you my colleague because mm -hmm. I feel like um, scientists and the medical community and physicians, a lot of what people say about this topic is really uh, driven by their opinions or their values and not really by data or good science. So I think you did a, a really brilliant job at presenting sort of a balanced view of what we know and don't know. Um, and I will say, I think a lack of data does continue to fuel the debate. I think we've really missed an opportunity to better understand um, some of the other neurobiology and risk at an individual level um, uh, for marijuana, but that's not my area of expertise. Um, um, but then, um, there are things that we know from a population level, which is really, you know, sort of my wheelhouse. I'm a public health professional, born and raised in, um, in, in public health, and I've spent a lot of my career trying to understand how do we, um, you know, address the emerging needs of our society and our community, while at the same time preserving public health for our communities, especially vulnerable communities. And I moved here from Maryland. Um, and then uh, being in Michigan, my understanding of vulnerable communities really has broadened. I live in the city of Flint. Um, I think Michigan has done a really great job in some um, regulatory areas that I want to kind of highlight and give you some things to think about as we move into this new era with um, marijuana. And one example of that would be the work that they've done around alcohol, regulating density. There are rules around how many liquor stores you can have in any one jurisdiction, any county. Um, and the way that plays out in Flint is Flint is the county seat for Genesee County. So in Flint, we have m more than about one and a half times what that number is. But then when you look in the larger county, the number is substantially lower. So when you average it all out, we hit that state target. So it's an example of where we have great laws and regulations in place, but they do give rise to these inequities when you drill down and start to look at, at smaller units. So I think it's important for us to understand um, number one, as we get good data, we want to not only implement good public policy, but we also have to have systems in place to monitor and surveil those policies to make sure that they're actually being implemented as they were designed and that they're being implemented fairly and equitably. So the question is, what have we learned from other industries that are relevant for this new now emerging um, landscape around uh, marijuana and medical marijuana and recreational <coughs> marijuana? Well, predictably, what's going to come with that? And I, I really appreciate the history because I hadn't heard it before. So if it was old news for them, it was it was um, innovation and, and new news for me. Uh, predictably, what's going to happen is we're going to have much uh, larger increase in the number of retailers and dispensaries, and there's it, it gives rise for me as a public health professional to great questions that I think need to be answered as we. Um, you know, bring this issue to the citizens. I do think communities should be able to have a say, but it is our job. It is the job of Michigan State University as a leading land grant institution, our major policy organizations, elected officials, policy makers, regulatory agencies to bring to bear the best that we have so that we can balance good business development and economic development with good public health. When you put those things together, that's where we get really good public policy. A couple of things that I have not heard really talked about, and I think we've learned this in other industries, so I want to draw your attention to them, is what are going to be the rules and the, and the policies around regulating density and placement? We know that we don't want communities that are over, oversaturated with, with liquor stores. And Michigan is a control state. We've done a really great job in that area. And then, like I said, you drill down and you look at places like Flint, they haven't exactly been the beneficiary, but the county remains stable. We don't want to um, mirror those problems in this new marijuana landscape. Why? Because we've already learned that lesson. If I said to you, we should have laws in Michigan that say you cannot put a strip club within three or 600 feet of a church or a school, nobody would object to that, right? You don't want your kids having to go to school across the street from a strip club. I don't know. Is it appropriate for them to have to go to school across the street from a dispensary? 
we haven't really people haven't really thought these issues through not only have they not really thought them through there are no real laws that govern them mostly what you get in in, in states is you have an office a regulatory office and it really is hinged on individuals and you are a real exception because you've been in that role for how long? 27 years? <laughs> That's like amazing. But I don't want the protection of our citizens and the public health of our citizens rising and falling on who's sitting in the chair. I want good public policy and laws on the book because we know what things work, right? Mm -hmm. We know we've learned a lot in the alcohol and tobacco industry around things related to advertisement. You are not allowed to market and advertise alcohol products to youth. But then unintervened and without enforcement, that is exactly what happens. You go into liquor stores and they sell uh, tobacco products and they sell alcohol products that come in the same flavors as now laters. Yeah. Who is that marketed towards? When is the last time any one of you had a now later? Right. right. You don't want a watermelon flavored beer or to smoke a strawberry flavored cigar. That's what kids like, right? So we need to make sure that we, the things that we've learned around how we regulate these types of industries, we are bringing to bear. It's not an anti-business model, right? But it is a protective model where, again, we're balancing the needs of our community and good opportunities for economic development with good public health. That is what public policy is all about. And we don't have that right now. I don't know if anybody here has uh, uh, experienced the marijuana gummy. They look just like the little Haribo gummies that um, uh, that kids eat. And don't get me wrong, I wouldn't expect to see a child in a dispensary and things like that. But we need to think about it. What are the lines? What are the boundaries? What are the things that we want to put in place? What are going to be the marketing restrictions? Are dispensaries going to be able to have billboards? Can they advertise on those billboards? Uh, gummies? Can they advertise cotton candy flavored um, uh, vapes? I mean, these are the real things that We've already learned we have good regulations in place in some of the other industries. And I think we just need to bring that stuff um, to bear here. The um, uh, last thing that I want to uh, say is, you know, this is not a, an issue that, you know, as a, as a public health researcher, activist, and advocate, or I think as somebody who's in regulatory affairs, or as a physician, I, don't, I, I think these are the kinds of folks that should be at the table, but the table needs to be much larger. Our elected officials need to be there, affected communities need to be there, advocates need to be there, people from the business sector need to be there. But I do think it's important to, to note that we've got to have the policies in place underneath of this so that as we move into a new era, we really can have it all. I don't think this is an either or. I don't think it's either it comes or we protect public health. I believe it's a both and. We can have both. We just have to bring to bear best practices in order to be able to do that. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. That's excellent information. So it's been about 10 years since we legalized medical marijuana, and here we are. Uh, this seems to be moving really fast, and as uh, many of our presenters said it's there are lots of questions i know i just returned from uh, canada toronto i think many of you know i direct the canadian study center at msu and they're struggling because october 17th um, recreational marijuana is legalized across the entire country and so they pushed that from june to october because of all of these kinds of questions that we've brought up today uh, one being, where do we put these dispensaries? If you're familiar with the larger city of, of Toronto, the largest city in Canada, um, there's a school on every corner. And uh, the first thing that came up was, where do we put these dispensaries? Well, we keep them so you know, a distance from our schools, right? That's not going to work. They'd have to go out to the island. Uh, they're, you know, they have to work something out. October 17th is coming around pretty quickly. Uh, what do we do about the people who have been arrested for these marijuana charges, uh, small, small uh, uh, possession of a small amount? Uh, do we impunge their records? No, we don't impunge their records. Already there are advertisements on TV telling people, and it's just like the advertisements you see for drunken driving, um, letting people know that if you smoke and drive, you will be arrested. If you are underage and smoking recreational marijuana, you will be um, arrested or, or charged with a crime, right? 
So lots, lots of questions, but right now we want to hear your questions. I want to tell you that you were not hallucinate, hallucinating. Talking about marijuana does not make you hallucinate. The ground was shaking, <laughs> but when I checked it out, I was going to say, could you hold off? It's actually out in the street. It's, it's underneath, so sorry about that. Um, let's start off with a few questions. It's going to be the first one to step up here. We have one one gentleman way over here in the corner. I will tell you that we need to have a microphone to you, so one's on the way. Uh, we have Impact Media filming for us, and that's going to go on our YouTube channel uh, so that people not attending today can still have access to the information. Has Sir? there been any uh, polling data that you know of that um, is talking about Proposal 1? Polling data talking about Proposal 1, there has been. Um, the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research has a state of the state survey. They survey a, about a thousand uh, voters uh, across the state and up and down the state. And uh, this was this took place in June, actually. And um, the 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 percentage was that it was recreational marijuana if it were voted on that day, the day they took that survey that it would be passed. But there was a real imbalance in the demographics of that. So the um, 60 and above, um, they would not pass it. 30 and under, they would definitely pass it. About 80% of the 30 and under said that they would vote to pass it. So some people are saying, gosh, is this a get out the vote effort, right? Um, because if our young people show up we, we know what's going to happen. And if our elderly uh, do, and if our elderly show up and the younger people do not show up, then we have a different situation. So thank you for asking. But other polling is being done. I believe there was one announced by, uh, um, was it Mears, I think, uh, just recently. So it's out there. And we're just to follow up too in the poll that uh, we're doing in the state, state survey going out in the field. We'll have that question again along with some of the data that Anna Marie just mentioned, that poll we did earlier this year, there were very few undecideds of all the proposals that we pulled on. And very few undecided. People had made up their mind. And it, despite the demographic imbalances, it was ahead at that time about 60 to 30, with about 10% of the time. Leah, we need to get quick with that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> My question is that um, medical marijuana was approved by a voter approved initiative and this time recreational marijuana is on the ballot, not through the legislative process. And so maybe a two part question for uh, Director Edgerton about what was done recently through legislation and the changes that needed to be made. Um, the legislature felt after 10 years to finally uh, implement some of those provisions and for our last speaker, Dr. Perholen, um, you mentioned the people that need to be at the table for the discussion and whether you think the proposal that's on the ballot will allow people to be part of that discussion if it's approved by the legisl or approved by the voters and requires a supermajority to make changes. I think it is on. Yep. Okay. So as to uh, the legislative proposal enacted in 2016, there were two bills, um, essentially one creating the regulatory market, um, named a number of five licenses. You could be a grower, an ABC with varying levels of plants. Um, you could be a provisioning center, most people recognize those as a dispensary. Um, you could be a lab, which is otherwise known as a safety facility uh, testing center. And then you could be a secure transporter. So um, it set up a regulatory framework. I think the legislature wanted to, to bring what was probably within the 2008 um, initiative passed kind of to fruition from a regulatory standpoint. That was not their first stab at it. Um, I think we've been trying to, the legislature had been trying to regulate um, medical marijuana for a number of legislative sessions. They were just successful in 2016 in actually enacting something. And within that, they created a licensing board, a whole structure of, of applicant requirements, um, and processes within that that we would have to, to execute in order to have a regulated market for Michigan. 
And, and um, I, I think it's vitally important that those folks be at the table now. It's really a call to action to the state, right? So voters get to say whether or not they want something, but what it actually looks like, the form and shape that it takes on, they're counting on their government to do a good job of that. And I think to do a good job of that, it actually needs to be very participatory. So the citizens get to say if they want it, but it really is on the state to make sure that it's done in a way that not only does no harm, but that does good for the, for the, for the state and, and for the counties across the state. And I think that's very easily attainable. Thank you. I have a question. Um, with respect to the laws that potentially need to change or to be modified or evaluated, as it relates to um, driving under the influence of marijuana, is there a testing for it similar to alcohol testing? Has that been evaluated? And with respect to jobs and drug testing, um, is, are there any potential changes as it relates to those things and recreational use of marijuana being decriminalized basically in, in Michigan? Because I think that's what this is about, is decriminalizing it. And is there any retroactive things for people who have been convicted of marijuana, maybe currently incarcerated, or is there anything looking once it's decriminalized? Uh, if it is passed, I'm not voting yes for it. But I'm just saying, is there any um, any unintended consequences? I, I appreciate it, um, um, your evaluation of what's going on with liquor stores and, and more urban uh, African-American communities and um, with respect to the disparities there. Because I, I do know that there is um, there's a great disparities in several uh, instances of uh, saturating, um, especially African American communities. But are there discussions on how to test it, how to deal with it if someone is driving, how to measure it compared to like alcohol, how to um, deal with it for recreational users for jobs, and, and the like. I can, I can speak broadly and then I hope yeah. you can get in specific. So, so this is a, like right in my wheelhouse. So we have a, a, a decennial survey that's done in the US every 10 years called the National Roadside Survey. It's funded by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I was a co-PI on the last iteration of that. And we did something that had never been done in the US before called the Drug Crash Risk Study. And we uh, did that study in one of the few places we could actually put it off, pull it off in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And what we did is we went out and we would um, whenever there was a, a crash that occurred, no matter what time of day, we sent a GO team. We had a police officer, a phlebotomist, a research assistant. We assayed and surveyed everybody involved in the crash. We got blood, saliva, survey data when possible. We went back and got hospital records. We went out to that same roadway a week later, same time of day, same direction of travel, randomly pulled over a motorist not involved in a crash and did the same protocol. I mean, it's the purest example of a case control study to really understand the impact of drug involved driving because we simply don't have that kind of data in the US. The sad but true fact is marijuana was a much smaller contributor to crash risk, but when combined with alcohol, it was like a synergistic risk. So the risk of crash involvement if you're you know consuming alcohol puts you at the greatest risk. Marijuana had an elevated risk compared to no substance use, but it was the marijuana and alcohol combined where the risk really went off the chart. Now we were able to assess that because we were able to collect biological samples and go back and analyze those and get very precise data. We don't have the greatest tools and technology around detection of substance use in the field. I'm assuming you're talking about drug recognition experts and, and things like that. The tools that we have are just not as objective. You know, we have rapid field assessment methods to, to measure blood alcohol and breath alcohol that simply don't exist for um, drugs. So again, those are the kinds of things that we, we, we need more innovation, we need better data, we need better tools and systems to be able to do that. Because my concern is if not, it will become a new tool of inequity to target already vulnerable populations. And that would be a real shame if, this be, if that is what comes out of this. So the question that you ask is a great one, but it, it's one that we need to put back on the field to say, where are these rapid assessment methodologies so that law enforcement and others do have the best tools in the field to identify um, um, and detect substances? 
But then we also need to understand as a field, how is that actually related to impairment, right? right? And we just simply, again, don't have great data on that. Not that I have any, a, a lot more information, but I, I do believe the governor um, adopted, and I don't want to say adopted, but selected a task force um, out of MSP to do a study of this made up of various stakeholders and partners. I'm not sure of the, the outcome of that um, discussion, but but as um, Dr. Holden said, you know, there are tools and it's just, we are not well advanced in the, in the study of, of detection on marijuana. I think there's new technologies coming on that, you know, similar to, you know, the breathalyzer, you know, 20 years ago, nobody even heard of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's what's going to have to evolve and that technology is going to have to catch up with what we think is going to be the reality for um, driving after smoking or other drugs, opiates or otherwise might be the case. Um, I, th I think in terms of the employment perspective, I think every employer in the state of Michigan is facing that. I think um, with, with, policies and, and things in place, I think there's going to be a recognition of how you recognize somebody who, you know, has a medical marijuana card, who uses it, rec you know, recreationally, is it just, you know, on the weekends, but they're a great performance, um, a performer otherwise, and I think that's going to be up to the individual employers, and I would expect that the businesses are going to start developing a lot more thorough policies on that versus maybe a zero tolerance. But I think most businesses just in general have zero tolerance. I mean, you don't get to be drunk on the job. You shouldn't be high on the job, whether it be opiate or otherwise. So I think those poly policy statements, but then it's a question of what do you do if, if somebody, you know, has a bad drug screen? They, you know, somebody questions a supervisor or otherwise. And then what are those next steps from there? And I think those are evolving. I just think, you know, the science out there is not there right away, and it's just evolving in terms of practices. I think we all recognize it's very difficult to hire people. I mean, we're shortage of employees, and because people can't pass a drug test. Um, and so what do you do in those next steps to um, you know, give people opportunities to be able to, to get a job, but yet recognizing they may have had a, a bad drug test because they went out on the weekend and smoked you know, high THC level contents of something. So. Shelly, what is MSP? Oh, Michigan State Police, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I see MSP Tom Sands here. I don't know if he wants to comment on it. I don't want to, you know, necessarily take it. But I don't know what, what the outcome of that. But there was actually a task force created to study this kind of issue um, and hopefully make some recommendations to the governor, to the legislature about, you know, next steps going forward, considering that we have a larger medical marijuana population going on and with the potential of recreational. How do, you know, law enforcement handle this on the roads? Thank you. Let me, let me just say a word about drug testing, a cautionary note. Everybody believes that if you get a medical test and it's positive, that means it's positive, you got whatever. That's not always true. And in the case of drug testing, there are good drug tests and bad drug, drug mm -hmm. tests. There's a specific methodology that's very accurate. A whole bunch of others that are not so good. It also depends on when you smoke, let's say it's marijuana, uh, and what your metabolic capacity is. So there are lots of variables in this thing, and a positive test doesn't always mean a positive test, and a negative test doesn't always mean a negative test. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very complex, and we don't have, it's right, we don't have the field testing now really for marijuana at all. Can I just add something one quick thing about that that we also learned from this, um, uh, from the National Roadside Survey, is that, and then not all tests are equal. So if you just smoke marijuana, and you do a saliva test, you're gonna get like marijuana residue in the buccal cavity and it's gonna come up high. But if you were to take a blood sample from that same person, it might not register that high because it hasn't been metabolized yet. Because then the other thing is, what, how do those levels then correspond to impairment? Because that's the thing we're really interested in. We've got, it took decades to get this figured out with alcohol. And we do actually have legislation. We have limits and per se limits and you know, limits with, you know, uh, it's showing signs of impairment. We are not quite there yet in the um, drug world. But I do think it's a thing we must take on with public policy. Because if we don't, it's just going to create new inequities. So for us to have recreational marijuana, but people then be unemployable when they're operating consistent with the law, is a problem. Because you could test positive for marijuana and not be impaired at all. So we ha we can't we can't not take this on. But the liability for the employer, if I test positive in the operation of my job after an accident, a true accident, 
um, my employer becomes liable to the person who may have been harmed or injured. And but that's that, why. Literally, we need standards. So we have yeah. this with alcohol. If you were on the job and you were probably anything over about 0.02, they would say you're not fit to be at work. You, you could get to 0.02 without a whole lot. That could be residual from the night before, medication related, you know, different things. But after that, folks can pretty much say, Maybe you're not impaired, but it's reasonable for an employer to have a zero tolerance policy, you know, sort of on the job. But again, we got to have the technology and the, the sort of guidelines and the understanding to say, what does that look like for marijuana? We don't want it to be a new tool of inequity or discrimination or bias, I, which I is agree. mostly going to hit underserved communities, communities of color, and young people. That's who is, this is mostly going to impact. So, yeah. Um, hi, this is for Shelly, and I um, hope I can get this out so that it's understandable. The pro proposal one is a lot more than just the hundred words that people are going to see on the ballot, and most people are not going to read that. Um, as I've been reading through it, um, the question I have for you is, uh, Prop 1 largely, like unlike the medical marijuana law, the Facilities uh, Licensing Act, and the Seed to Sale Tracking Act, which create quite an extensive regulatory framework in, in, um, in statute, and then allows you to do rules. Prop 1 is basically saying, oh, well, Larry can do this rule, they can't do that rule. And um, two phrases that I find kind of conflicting is in one place, you have up to one year after the effective date of the initiative to come up with the rules, to get them in place. But then in another place, if you do not have an adequate number of licenses already issued within one year, then anybody can go up to their municipality and say, you gotta give me a license. And the municipality has to give them a license if they're otherwise in compliance with, with the law. And then during the time, the effectiveness of their license, if you then do start to do licenses, they're not, they can't be regulated by you. And so just wanted to ask you, those deadlines in my mind are unreachable, are conflicting, and, um, and so I was just wondering how was Lara looking at that? And, and you know, are you thinking then of just trying to take the medical marijuana rules and mirror, have those mirrored into this. So that's along the line of the question. Thank you, Sue. If that makes sense. Thank no, you. Thank you. That, 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 you know, applaud you for reading through it because uh, you're seeing some of the nuances that we're reading um, when we're looking at this from a perspective of what will we have, what steps will we need to take if this is passed by the voters in terms of attempting to implement it. Um, and you're right, we have a year. Um, you know, one of the things in the ballot proposal that is very different from the facility is the department has a lot more authority than going through a, um, the licensing board. So with that, we are able to simplify the potentially the applications. And if you read through that, there's some, um, while we have a year, there are also some um, abilities for people if you're a class A or if you're already currently a medical marijuana holder licensee, you know, we can use a lot of that information that's already there. Um, we, are, we are looking at this because we want to be prepared because we know a one year time frame is a very short time frame. I mean, we were very fortunate, had a dedicated team that was able to pull off the medical marijuana, which was a lot more complicated. Um, but I would suspect that we will be able to use that knowledge in a lot of ways for the recreational side if it should pass. Um, we will be able to move pretty quickly because it's the department's authority and we don't have to set up a meeting for a board and have people appointed and you know that that can take a lot of time in itself and scheduling you know these people are pretty much volunteers um, if you are not aware of it it's a five-member board appointed by the governor um, and they come and serve their time you know they, they're basically getting paid you know travel and expense that day so they don't they're not making salaries um, and so I think you know from our perspective that's going to help speed things along um, I do think there's nuances within that that we will have to interpret and we will have to adopt rules and we will move that process along just as quickly as we did with with the medical side 
Hi. Uh, so in the proposal, as it stands and will appear on the ballot, there is no revenue set aside for mental health, for substance abuse issues, or for public health, uh, unlike what you see with gambling revenue or with tobacco revenue. So do we think that that's a problem in terms of underfunding public health? Do we think that there's going to be increased use? And given the lack of you know, the gap between public knowledge and sort of the you know, available medical knowledge and literature that you cited, um, do you think that there's a risk of people sort of WebMD diagnosing themselves and then deciding that easily available recreational cannabis is a great treatment? Particularly vis-a-vis -vis veteran suicide, which is specified in the ballot uh, yes. that public money would go towards studying marijuana as a treatment for veteran suicide, even though in the National Academies of Sciences, uh, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, marijuana use or frequent marijuana use was not only shown to be statistically associated with psychoses and schizophrenia, but also development of depressive disorders, suicidal ideation, suicidal completion, social anxiety disorders, particularly with the dose response uh, of heavy use. So I guess there's Thank a lot you. in that. What a good question. Could you pull up the ballot proposal? It's not fancy, but we do have a copy of uh, a slide that presents the proposal. I will say I think it is a tremendous missed opportunity. And again, it's about the policies. It's about what's written and enforceable. It's a tremendous missed opportunity to not have something set aside and dedicated for dealing with the public health implications even if it's just the ongoing monitoring and surveillance and expansion of services for people who may fall in that small percent who develop some kind of pathological use or escalate um, in use as a function of the increased availability. I, I actually think it's sort of irresponsible to not have that written in um, as, a, as a part of it. And, and we have great examples across the country of how people have done that and in other examples where we've done it with tobacco and alcohol taxation and things like that. So to me, it's just it's a missed opportunity. It makes me question whether or not people are really tending to the larger public health uh, potential implications in a landscape where there really is a sort of a dearth of data. But the things that we do know, we need to have resources set aside to address them. Yeah, so, you know, um, we already see all kinds of misuse. There are lots of people out there who are treating their anxiety yeah. with marijuana. Well, there are lots of people who use alcohol to treat their anxiety too. That's probably not so good for you. The other thing I would say is, one, public health has been tremendously underfunded in this country for a long time. We all know that. And two, mental health is nobody's priority, really. Um, people with severe psychiatric disorders don't vote. And so the, the, the mental health infrastructure has also been tremendously underfunded if anyone, any one of you want to go to a community mental health center, I will personally take you there and show you how underfunded things are. Thank you. We actually have that as a proposed title of a future forum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll be calling you. <laughs> and it's worse for young people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. I have a question about um, secondhand smoke effect. We seem to be very protective in our culture with secondhand cigarette smoke that children don't take that in and we discourage it in the home. Um, certainly in public areas it's been boycotted or um, banned. And I'm a little concerned about the effect, the secondhand smoke effect. Already um, with the medical marijuana, some children are coming to school, even elementary school age, already with secondhand smoke effect. And some of the high schoolers. So there's already an effect in our culture. Um, my daughter lives in Los Angeles, and every time I visit her, I notice no matter where we go, I smell marijuana. So there's, I don't know if you've thought about um, having some protective regulation or um, thinking forward on the effect that we can kind of protect our culture in Michigan, um, secondhand smoke while driving, um, secondhand smoke for children in other public areas. I don't think people have thought about that, but you know there are alternatives to smoking uh, marijuana. Um, there are edibles, so you know that's that's an alternative, correct? Um, I see that as maybe a symptom of the ballot proposal passing. That might be something that's dealt with down the road. But I would think 
that it would relate some in, in so many ways to what we have in place for tobacco smoking currently. But it's not in the states where they already have it legalized, they're not addressing it. So I'm, I'm you know, not there, are, um, there are about 30 states that have legalized marijuana in some way, and they vary so much from state to state. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, some states have decriminalized it. In other words, maybe a $2,000 fine might be a $500 fine. Some, some states have looked at where the dispensaries would go. Some states haven't begun to really think about it. It's just been mishap. So um, Michigan um, may or may not have the opportunity to work through those issues. We'll see. But I think you should continue to talk about this issue. It's important to you and uh, see where we go because People aren't thinking about that 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 I that I see in the literature. So, thank you. Are you aware of whether the state or public sector consultants or Citizens Research Council or IPSER has done any kind of research or study about how the passage of Prop One might affect Michigan's tourism industry? I'm not aware. I'm not aware. But we can look again, look at other states as an, an example of what what might happen. Uh, Colorado is, is one one state that uh, has seen a real increase. I want to tell you a funny story. Um, my husband went out to Colorado to help his brother move back to Michigan. And um, he, he went there, packed the car, was driving back, and as soon as he crossed the state line, he was on. He had a Colorado uh, license plate. He was eating a banana, and he threw his banana peel out the window. He was uh, very quickly pulled over, and uh, they had a conversation. The police officer and he had a had a conversation, and and um, the the officer just gave him a warning: "We do not throw these things out the window," and let him go. And his brother said. That's not why he, passed. he pulled you over. He did not pull you over because you threw a banana peel out the window. You have a Colorado license plate, and you're going through a state right outside of Colorado. So I'm thinking through my geography. And so he was probably just checking. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that those are the kinds of things we're going to see with all of the different rules from state to state. Yesterday there was a news story that the CDC issued a study that found uh, two million middle school and high school students who have, at one time or another, uh, uh, used e-cigarettes to vape marijuana. Now all of that would be illegal, regardless. And it raises the question, as we're talking about public policy and how we go forward in Michigan, there's been no discussion at all about what is the reality of people using marijuana in Michigan illegally, um, and I would think part of the reason for any public policy would be actually to bring all of this to light. So whatever you feel about this particular ballot proposal, it ought to be viewed, I think, and I'd ask the panelists to address this question, that how, you, how, do you, how do you decide this question in a context that is much larger than is it a good idea or a bad idea based on the evidence available. Because so far there's no evidence brought to brought forth here as to what the size of the illegal market is. And I don't know if anyone knows that. I don't. But I challenge experts to give us some clue. Well, I'll say a couple things. I think Jed said that one of the best things, which is that public health is grossly underfunded. Right, because these, these issues that you're talking about, you know, and again, it's like that, that public health with these other kind of development issues, you know, come together to fund public policy. But public health is grossly underfunded. And so, you know, we, we look at from our major surveys, and I didn't read that, but I'm assuming it's probably something like the Monitoring the Future Survey or the uh, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance um, Survey, where that data is coming from. You know, uh, experimentation with alcohol and marijuana have become somewhat normative. It's not normal for kids to become heavy users, but it's very common for, I think the numbers are about 70% of um, kids that are graduating high school have experimented with alcohol. 
the number is a little bit lower for marijuana, but experimentation is actually um, not too uncommon. But really, it's the question of what are the things that have kids go from what might be considered normative behavior to something that becomes um, a potential signal for future problems, right? Most of what we know about the drug and alcohol tra trajectories for young people, that trajectory gets set before they go to college. Typically, kids don't just get to college and then start drinking. They actually started drinking in high school. There was a particular trajectory that got accelerated when they you know, were in college. So I think if we had better public health systems and systems of care and prevention, we could, one, understand these things and then put the things in place to ensure that people are protected, especially young people. Because what we don't want to do is create a problem that's going to show up for us 20 years from now. I did have done. another. I know that there were um, 30 states that have passed um, legal marijuana. Um, Some one kind being of California. Thank you. Yeah. One being California, um, and then there's some other states that have broad legalized marijuana. The question I have is, um, the states with more urban populate populations, what have been the consequences or unintended consequences of um, marijuana in, let's say, Compton or um, Crenshaw, or you name it, in those states um, that have more of a um, minority populations and what have been the implications legally um, in terms of the public health populations or even the regulatory uh, or law enforcement implications for those communities. I can say there is not a whole lot of readily available data on that and I think it's a problem that the states have is that they put you know, put whatever policies that they have in place, but then they haven't done the work to track and see what difference does it make. Do you actually get, you know, a lower criminal justice contact considering, you know, a, a lion's share of young, poor, inner city males are being arrested because of low level drug offenses, most of them for possession, not even distribution related, and then end up with these criminal records. But if no one's, you have to have some resources to be able to collect that data. So again, it's a missed opportunity for us to un really understand what works, how, for whom, et cetera. And if you don't have money set aside in these initiatives to fund that kind of work, it's never going to happen. So a lack of data fuels that debate. But those are great questions that we should look at in Michigan. If I could just say one, one slightly peripheral thing about that. We have a 50-year history of criminalization. Talked about low level offenses in this country. If you really believe criminalization works, I get rich to sell you. The evidence is, is absolutely clear. And if you don't believe it, you know, you got to think again. So I'm for regulation. It's kind of, kind of, kind of weird. We keep talking about public health being underfunded. And so I'm kind of wondering about how we view marijuana as far as a regulator, as far as where it fits on the line of like something like opioids, which are killing lots of people, and something like sugar, which is causing other sorts of health costs. But it's like a huge gray scale of different drugs causing different public health issues. Where does marijuana kind of fall in that? And how do we decide how much of these limited resources do we allocate to regulating marijuana versus something potentially more dangerous? I, I, I think that's a great question, but I think the problem should pay for itself. If y'all would increase the tax on sugary beverages, you could take some of that money and then, I'm, I'm not even kidding you. I, I These things can pay for themselves. You should be taking money out of tobacco taxes and putting it into cancer treatment, cancer research, you know, school-based prevention programs. Like these, these things can actually pay for themselves. And I do not think it's an either or, it's a both and. We can have it all. Right? And we've done this really well in alcohol. We put alcohol legislation in place, and then the, the revenue that gets generated from that, the taxes that get generated from that, the money that gets generated out of you know, ordinance violations, et cetera, fuel enforcement. They fuel prevention. They fund treatment. So I think the point that you're making is right, but you know, that, that's how you regulate it. You, you, you raise tobacco taxes 50 cents, you're going to lose 15% of your smokers in two years. We know that, and then you take those extra taxes and you reinvest it. You add the tax to sugary beverages, guess what's gonna happen? 
people are going to drink fewer sugary beverages, and then those excess revenues becomes money that you can then turn back around and reinvest in. And I think people should have the right. If you want to smoke pot, you know, drink sugary drinks, smoke cigs, drink, all, fine. But then you have to pay for the system of care and prevention for those problems. And it is easily accomplished. There's a little bit of that going on in Colorado again in that uh, Pueblo County has noticed a, a small increase in small level crime and homelessness. And so they have uh, devoted more funding to those problems, um, yet they're still coming out ahead on the, on the ledgers, you know, on the taxes. Yeah, we'll go back to the previous question for that one. <clears throat> there was a um, multi-year study done by the uh, National Bureau of uh, Economic Research on the seven states that legalized uh, medical marijuana and what the effect was on the population. They did find that there was an increase in the use of marijuana on people 21 years old. They found that there was a 5 to 6% increase of experimentation or use by those 12 to 20 years old. But they found that there was no, um, um, there was no nothing associated with adolescent drinking, uh, and nothing associated with uh, any increase in heroin or other opiate uh, abuse. There was an increase in binge drinking, however. Thank you. The one caveat I would say for that too is be weary of data and stats. So if somebody were to ask me today in Michigan, uh, Deborah, did you smoke marijuana in the last year? There's only one right answer, which is what? No. No, I don't have a medical card. Recreation law gets passed and somebody asks me on a survey, Deborah, did you smoke marijuana in Michigan last year? I don't know, I might say yes. Right? People are, there's, there's, there's bias again, and, and that's why we have to, this isn't something that you can do one time or that you can do cross-sectionally. You really have to monitor over time. But, you know, as somebody who's done a lot of survey research, I know how these things work. People are less likely to report illegal or criminal behavior. So when the behavior becomes legal or the stigma associated with it goes down, you're going to get a natural increase in reporting that's just re related to people giving more truthful responses because there's more social acceptance. So we have to actually look over time. And again, these are not expensive systems that I'm talking about. But without them, we'll just keep talking and talking and talking. And I'll keep saying a lack of data fuels the debate. <laughs> so enough already. Let's like get the data and really understand it. Excellent point. Excellent segue. Uh, I was going to talk about data. As you read these articles, there's so many statistics that can be thrown out there. You don't even know what statistics are sanctioned or not. <laughs> so I guess the question I would want to know is uh, a lot of the people that are against the legalization of recreational marijuana cite a lot of statistics. And are we far enough away from the states that have legalized recreational marijuana to talk about kind of the, you know, it's easy to see that when you pop this balloon and it becomes legal that there's going to be Mardi Gras for six months. And then everything's going to settle out. The newness is going to go away, the fashion, everyone trying it maybe for the first time or whatever. Then, then the interest is going to wane because now it's legal. It's no longer taboo. I think about Germany allowing youth to drink beer when they want to, but they just don't want to because it's not forbidden anymore. You know. And so I just wonder, is there any studies, because I think the people that are opposed to it talk about, well, then you know, in Colorado there was a spike in marijuana-related marijuana you know, auto accidents, and, and, and that's understandable. Does that plateau and fall off once things kind of normalize? And are we there yet where we can study some of that data in these states that are further away from the legalization date? Yeah. The, the short answer is sort of. <laughs> like, really, like, sort of, but not really. Yeah. And I just think it's smart for the states that do go online. It's just, it's like, it's self-serving. And it's for your own self-preservation. You know, Michigan has... Um, it's really interesting because if you look at average health stats, right, they rank the 83s. How many counties are there? 83. They rank the 83 counties. And it's really interesting because if you look at average statistics, you won't find very many places in Michigan that fit the average. You know, you can get to an average because this guy has a 100 and this guy has a zero. So the average across those two is 50. But nobody in the population is a 50. Most people are very high or most people are very low. That's how health in Michigan sort of looks. You've got places that are generally healthy 
and communities that are generally healthy and populations that are generally healthy. And then you've got the other sort of end of the pole and people that are experiencing major health challenges. And that's everything here. Some of it's rural, some of it's urban, some of it's minority, some of it's immigrant. You know, people talk about Flint and lead. There's like lead problems in Grand Rapids and all over the state, right? I'm not minimizing what's happening in Flint because it is important and it was preventable. But my point is, you know, we have a stake. It's how do you stabilize the health of Michigan residents and then bring a scalpel to the places where there are needs? And to do that, you have to have the data to do it. And I think Michigan should, should be collecting their own data on these indicators and looking and giving itself a report card. This is where we're doing well. This is who we're doing well for. These are communities that are doing well. And these are the places that are not. And then allocate the resources appropriately based on need. But without data, we just can't do that. So even with some of the other states put out, I have a question mark over it. You know, I've sat on the Governor's Public Health Commission. I'm like, oh wow, I hope there's some kind of, you know, group that gets formed out of this. I'd love to be involved because we do need integrity and we can't say what's so if we don't know what's so. And data's the only access for that. And we should be collecting that ourselves and be an exemplar for other states. If you're gonna do it, this is how you do it well and preserve public health and public safety and generate the resources to be able to do it. Well, we've had an amazing discussion. Lots of, uh, lots of questions have come up, uh, several that I hadn't thought of previously. Did you have a question over here? If you do, okay. Um, so um, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of things, themes, so to speak. But uh, before I get into those, I promised our speakers to have the, the last word, so to speak, their call to, own call to action. So I, I think I'll call on them to, to do that now. Um, Shelly, you want to start us off? Call to action? <laughs> call to action. I think yours will be read the proposal. When you yeah. go in to vote, go. read the proposal. No, I, you know, we, we're all in this together, I will say, um, you know, medical or the recreational if it's adopted. And I think to, to Dr. Holden's point, I mean, you need stakeholders at the table for the discussion of whatever this might be. A lot of issues raised regarding mental health and, and the services provided and what can we do from a public health perspective. And those are, are issues and things that we will take back as if the recreational markets pass, because I do think there's... Um, a need for those kind of things. But again, we'll wait for the voters. So I, as Sue or has you know, aptly pointed out, some of the nuances we're going to have to deal with um, if it does pass, I, I would suggest all of you read, read the ballot proposal and, and decide for yourself. Thank you. I feel like I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> what were the main things of your uh, presentation. I, I think we know what they are, but let's just see if we got it right. <laughs> yeah, right. We need good data. <laughs> we need resources to do that good data and put a, a good system of, of care and prevention in place to ensure that, you know, we really can have it all. We can, if the voters so choose. And that's my thing. I always, you know, I'm a Game of Thrones fan, so it's like, <laughs> winter is coming. Like, I feel like this is coming. If not this year, it's coming in a future year. And I don't think we should be reacting or responding to anything. We should be taking lessons learned and best practices from all of our other industry and regulatory examples and putting those things together now. Thank you. Well, so Mark Twain said there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you just got to have good data. One, one, again, one thing we know uh, is that we have a 50-year history of an absolutely failed policy, yet people hold on to it for moral reasons, I think, which is criminalization of drugs. And uh, at some point, we got to get beyond that. Al Gore said something about eventually you get to binary choices, either for something or against something. Once you get to the binary choice, usually people make the right decision. Maybe. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. So um, my takeaway for, for this discussion is read the proposal. <laughs> read the proposal before you go into that voting booth. And then secondly, vote. Uh, that's important. Vote, vote, vote. I'm also hearing that we need more research. 
uh, look at what's happening in other states and actually in other countries because they're looking at the U.S. as a possible market, a uh, global market. So this is, this is bigger, even bigger than, than Michigan. So look at that and, and think for yourself um, where you want to go before you actually walk into the, to the booth. Continue to ask these questions, ask them again and again to different people in different audiences. I commended the media for covering this earlier, and you know I'll reiterate that, but there aren't many public, real public forums going on with this, and so I commend you for showing up and, and putting your question out there. Uh, for now, I want to bid you adieu, but I do want to ask you to finish your evaluation for the forum. On October 17th, we'll look at the prevailing uh, wage law or proposal. And then, not last but least, could you help me thank our panelists for being here today?